Conversations with Nikki is brought to you by studyapps.co.za, South Africa's leading education app for tablets. Welcome, welcome to Conversations with Nikki. Well, it's a show about you and me and uh, the people we aspire to be and really how, how to become that kind of person. My name's Nikki Severini. It's uh, fantastic to be with you. Thank you so much for tuning in. And I would also like to welcome our syndication partner listeners. Um, that's Kawi FM in Port Alfred, Eldos FM in Eldorado Park, West Coast FM, Namibia, also 90.3. 3MC in Plet, Neisner FM, Wild Coast FM in East London, Bay FM in PE, and Chai FM here in Johannesburg as well. So, um, tuning in, you may have to, during the conversation, tune out, and that's not a problem because every show on Conversations with Nikki is podcast. Very, very easy. All you have to do is visit the website, www.conversationswithnikki.co.za. Incidentally, Nikki is spelled N-I-K-I, and you can catch all the podcasts there. And if you prefer, you can become a follower of the podcast. So you just click on the link um, to the podcast website and then become a follower and then every single week the podcast will be sent to you it really is as simple as that today's show is going to be very very interesting and we're going to be talking about challenging belief systems now we all have a belief system whether uh, it comes from a political background whether it's a religious background socially and the way we interact with people Basically, it's the way we see the world. It's the way we interact with the world. It's the opinions that we have. It's the things that we do every single day. Perhaps you are acutely aware of what your belief systems are and what you can and can't do. And, and maybe listening right now, you haven't really thought about any stringent rules that you have or ways of being. But I just wonder, sitting here right now, how many of you listening have ever truly challenged your belief system? Have any of you stopped at one point and thought about whether that way of thinking, being, acting is serving you, is serving your family? And if not, have you been able to make a change if you've really wanted to make that change? Well, as I said, that's, that's really what we're going to be focusing on today. I have such an interesting guest who I went along and I watched him in a talk just a few nights ago and I thought, wow, this would really make for an interesting conversation. His name is Kasim Hafiz. He is here in South Africa, really briefly. He goes around the world talking and it's about his changing of his belief system. So we'll tell you a little bit more. Kasim, welcome to the show. No, thank you very much. It's great to be here. I know you're very, very busy. So thanks for your time. Not at all. So Kasim, you have had, I mean, listening to my introduction about this whole belief system, how we're brought up in a certain way, you know, and sometimes it's, you know, it's, it's dogma. It's perhaps what we're told from a young age and it's um, through religion, through schooling, through politics, whatever. And you were brought up in a very particular way. You were, bo you were born in the UK. Um, um, and you were brought up uh, at your religion, you're, you're, you're Muslim. Yeah. So let's expand on that a little bit, because um, if, if I'm right, you're, you're Sunni Muslim, which is more of a, an orthodox arm of, 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 the, of Muslim, isn't it? Yes. It okay. Is. Yes. Okay. So your belief system growing up? Um, I mean, um, um, we were always Sunni Muslim. And with, with Sunni Islam, it splits into more branches. It's, it's not just there's one or uh, one branch of Sunnism. It, br it branches off into all these smaller branches with different and varying beliefs and <coughs> um, and varying levels of observance to certain things. Uh, we were we weren't extreme, you know. There, there's the, a real radical element within Sunnism, also in mm -hmm. Shia Islam, but we we weren't radical, we weren't extreme. But I was always there was always this um, latent anti-Semitism which I always grew up around. There was always um, hostility and mistrust when it came to Jews and especially Israel. So, what does it mean to be to be brought up that way? Is it the way? So, you obviously you, you, you're you're praying that way. Is it the the food that you're eating? Is it the clothes that you're wearing? Is it the people that you're interacting with? Um, if from a religious point of view, when you're brought up as Muslim, it, it's it's everything. It's the food you eat. Your diet's very particular. You can only eat halal or. Um, there's certain meats you can't eat. You know, you avoid alcohol. You eat 
the religious celebrations were a key part of growing up. So, so it it is all encompassing. And what's happened in the UK and in many parts of the world when Muslim communities have come from overseas, like my grandparents came from Pakistan, that they, they live in communities together. You know, um, so my surrounding community was predominantly Muslim. So you would go to a Muslim school. I actually. So you would only mix with Muslims. I went to a state school. Oh, interesting. Uh, okay. Because at that time. We didn't really have any Muslim schools. I mean, in the mm. UK, Muslim schools are very new, you know, less than a decade old. Uh-huh. So I went to a state school. but And to be honest, when I was growing up, it was still quite mixed. I mean, it has changed now. And the schools in predominantly Muslim areas, the majority of students are Muslim. So they're only really mixing with Muslim students. But the students I was mixing with, it was a very small segment of wider society. There were Muslim students. There were some white British students. There were some black British students. And that was really it. It wasn't a true representation of the kind of multicultural society Britain is. So you're talking about you when you were brought up, you were brought up with the anti-Semite sentiments. Yeah. These were the messages. Yes. And what about anti-Christian? Any anti any other religion or way of being? Um, it was never really raised, I guess. It was never uh, big on the agenda. And also, I think if we were exposed to any anti-Christian sentiment. I went to school with Christians. I could give them a human face. Right. It's a lot easier to challenge uh, misconceptions or stereotypes when you can put a very human face to it. You know, I, I didn't know... You didn't interact with Jews at all. At then, all. I, uh, I mean, the first Jewish person I actually interacted was with... I was in my 20s. Mm. So so how was... I mean, what were you told about Jews growing up? Where, where did these in anti-Semitic messages come from? Initially, they were very kind of subtle almost. And if Israel or Jews were mentioned, there was all these almost Nazi-like stereotypes. You know, the Jews control the banks, the Jews control all the money, mm. you can't trust the Jews, all these things. Um, my father was much more extreme. I mean, he would frequently say that Hitler was a great man and the one mistake he had made was that Hitler didn't wipe out all the Jews. Now when you went to school and you learned about the Second World War and you learned about the Holocaust and Hitler and how he murdered so many innocent people, did it ever cross your mind that perhaps what your father had said was wrong? Did you ever start to question and doubt um, that which you had been taught? I'm talking Uh, about at a young age now. It's very difficult, I guess the way I was brought up, and sometimes in certain communities, you don't question what you're told. Mm-hmm. You're giving it, and you take it as fact, even though it is somebody's opinion. So growing up, learning about the Holocaust, learning about Hitler, you think, yes, this is a tragedy, but you sometimes you kind of argue, you wrestle with the idea. You think, yes, this was awful, but you do one of the two things. You go... Was there a reason? Is there kind of a deep reason why the Holocaust happened? Maybe it wasn't so black and white. Or the other thing you'd do is go, okay, the Holocaust was awful, but now the the Jews uh, haven't learned from it almost. You know, they're, they're, how they treat other people is like the Nazis treated them almost. So you had been told the way Jews uh, were treating other people, controlling the banks, doing whatever, but you had had no experience. And again, no questioning on your side. You just really blindly believing what you're being told. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, Which I suppose you can say about uh, uh, all all areas of life, we, we, are, we, we do kind of believe what we're told. You, t- you take we what go you're on given. The path. And mm. I think when you're at a young age and growing up, you just don't understand why anyone would lie about it. You know, it, it doesn't make sense. So you think there must be some truth in it. And when enough people are saying the same lie, when enough people just outside the family, uh, people in the community are saying the same lie. When they're using the term Jew as an insult, you think, well, there must be some basis for it. Mm. It just doesn't happen for no reason. Mm. Now, you, you say that the, this radical Muslim approach uh, wasn't really around when you were growing up. But you said there was a pivotal moment that you remember very, very clearly when a book came out. And that seemed to change everything. It almost seemed to galvanize the Muslim community. Perhaps you can explain that further. Yes. um, The book was Salman Rushdie's Satanic Verses, which, um, I mean, Muslims all over the world found, you know, vastly offensive. I mean, reading it, it is an extraordinarily boring book, um, without a doubt. But uh, it was deemed offensive. And I don't know. I mean, looking back, I think it may have been frustration within the Muslim community at other things. And this was the first time they were able to channel that anger into something tangible. Um, and there were protests all over the world. You know, people would buy satanic verses to burn it at these protests. Um, 
And from that point on, you saw the mood change almost. You know, where mosques were mosques. People went to pray, people celebrated their festivals, did all the things which are quite normal in Muslim societies. They started to be this political voice emerging, uh, normally externally, asking, OK, look, you guys pray and you guys fast and you do all these things, but what are you actually doing? You know, look at what's happening in Bosnia, in Chechnya, in Kashmir, in Palestine. What are you actually doing? And it was the use that was accompanied by this use of very graphic imagery of dead children and so on, which you were constantly bombarded with. So really, that's when you had the religion and the politics merging. Yes, that's and, that's and a whole new movement. Yes, um, which which we talk about today. We're 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 going to take a very quick break, and we'll continue with that because I want to know from you how that affected you. Um, you know, growing up in in a Muslim family, as you say, with these um, quite radical beliefs passed down from your from your dad, um, and of course you you continued on that path. So we'll continue with that. And if you have just tuned in. Welcome. It's Conversations with Nikki, and I'm Nikki Siberini. We're having a very interesting conversation with Kasim Hafiz, who is here visiting South Africa, sharing his story um, with us. Now, Conversations with Nikki is sponsored by Study Apps, and Study Apps is really a system of learning and testing yourself. And it's it's for young students at school or for varsity. And because statistics have shown that students don't review what they've learned, they'll forget. If they don't review it, they're going to forget 70% within an hour and 84% within 48 hours. And apparently, the key to effective long-term learning is testing. And that's what Study Apps is all about. It's They are the market leaders in revision and test preparation. It's about studying smarter, not harder. So if you're interested, go along to their website, studyapps, one word, dot co, dot za. That's studyapps, dot co, dot za. And a reminder that if you do have to leave this conversation for a while, while. Um, every conversation is a podcast. You just need to visit the website Conversations with Nikki and the uh, the podcast will be there. So Kasim, we were up to a point, you said, you know, growing up in the UK to Pakistani parents and uh, being quite a, a growing up Sunni Muslim, <clears throat> I beg your pardon, and saying that reading this, the, the book of uh, the satanic verses changed everything and seemed to galvanize the Muslim society. And that's where you had the crossover uh, very much, well, we could say, in the UK and other Western parts of, of the world where you had um, religion and, and politics merging. So how did this affect you personally? Um, at the time, it, it didn't have a direct effect. I mean, at the time, I was still very young. You know, I was seven, eight years old, and you were seeing this developing. You are seeing this rise in radicalism and also the thing was the radicals spoke English and this was the thing you know all the teachers of religion etc had either come from Pakistan or India so English wasn't the first language so these guys were coming with this political message uh, melding it with religion and they were speaking English um, but again you know it, it didn't really mean that much to me it was something in the background mm-hmm. the real change for me happened was um, when I went to Pakistan in 2000 on uh, a family holiday to visit family, when I was confronted by these images of violent extremism. Um, A a terrorist organization, which is quite popular in that region at the time, were glorified. You know, there was this huge imagery all over the place. Uh, You know, images, the American flag, the Indian flag, the Israeli flag on fire. Uh, AK-47s and these huge slogans in Urdu, you know, destroy the enemies of Islam and so Mm. on and so forth. So if you look at that rationally, you'd think, okay, these guys are are crazy, you know, (laughs) they're they're, they're propagating violence. But I kind of connected that with all these years of ideas I've heard that, you know, you can't trust the Jews. You know, Israel is doing genocide and all these things. America is great Satan. All these images I'd seen and, you know, Bosnia and all these related back to America and America's inaction. So it kind of made sense to me. It, it, it added up and it was literally connecting the dots and thinking, OK, this makes sense. I've constantly been given this idea of being a victim and being not part of the society I'm in and people are oppressing me. 
here's somebody doing something back. They may be using violence, but it's it's a response. And when you're 16, 17, it kind of appeals to that aspect of you as well. I find it so interesting. You talk about if you look at rationally, you see it for what it is. But being where you were, you had a completely different response to it. I mean, would you say that you were violent at all growing up? Did you have any type of violent thoughts growing up? Was there violence around you? No, not at all. I mean, you know, I had a temper like any kind of uh, teenager. Young teenager. Yeah, Mm. exactly. But no, I mean, there wasn't any real violence at all that I think of you know the odd fight in the school playground was as kind of violent as it got I guess and yet when you thought about um, being Muslim and being the underdog so to speak yeah. you you realize that perhaps a way through would be with was with, with using violence well yes it I guess was it just a concept in your mind or was it something that you actually would have considered doing it was something I did actually consider uh, many years later I, I was well on that kind of path because it made sense I know as crazy as it, it made sense because all I've been confronted with over the last few years are these graphic images of violence that's happening in Bosnia and so on and so forth so you kind of think okay maybe the only thing that will work you know protests don't work all these things don't work maybe violence is kind of the only way forward so you kind of look to these extremists as almost heroes really you think you know they're they're fighting back when you came back from Pakistan how Uh, did you then see the world uh, very differently. Um, I started really immersing myself in that particular way of thought. You know, I changed my adherence uh, to religion. I, you know, I was still Muslim, still Sunni, but I embraced a much more radical and extreme stream of religion, which was very dogmatic. And it made all the answers very clear. It, everything was very black and white, war and peace. There can be no peace because they're at war with us. We're right, they're wrong. Um, so I became more radical and more of an activist, really. Mm. Uh, and the thing with a lot of radicalism is, Muslim radicalism, is that the main focus is Israel. Israel becomes the focus. And this obviously resonated with me because I already had very anti-Semitic views already ingrained into my thinking. And how did your family support you during this time? Were they proud of you, this direction that you had taken? Uh, I think many didn't realize what was going on. I think for many, you know, I, I started to grow a beard. I started to wear like the traditional Arabic dress, which, you know, for me as a Pakistani Muslim has nothing to do with my culture. You know, mm-hmm. It's a cultural thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but part of kind of this supremacist movement is that we all have to adopt one way of thinking. I, I think they just assumed I was becoming more observant uh-huh. than actual changes. I mean, the only time there was slight kind of discussions was when I would question their beliefs and go, you know, you're doing this, but is this right? Because with radical Islam, its greatest almost enemy is other Muslims because it sees every other Muslim almost as apostates, as deviants. So there are certain things that my family had done for years which I questioned. And that would sometimes cause arguments, but there was never what's going on or there was never this kind of real stop doing what you're doing almost approach to things. You describe your father as being radical. Yes. Um, and uh, these uh, messages that he passed on from a young age about Hitler and the killing of the Jews. How do you think he would have responded had he known where you were in your mind moving towards a more violent way of, of practicing your religion, your faith, your belief, your system? Yeah. Um, I mean, at that time, my parents were now separated. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't think, I mean, he would have had a problem with it, to be completely honest. You don't think he would have had a problem? I don't think he would have had a problem mm-hmm. with it. Um, because, I mean, I mean it's difficult to tell because, yes, I mean, we don't know, know you but don't, you don't in know. your opinion. But, but going on the kind of person he was and the messages he passed on and some of his views, I, I can't see him having a huge problem with it. Even, I think, maybe, I'm just speculating, the actual committing acts of violence, he may have kind of backed away from that. But actually inciting violence, I don't think you would have had too much of a problem with. Of course, then 9-11, and the world changed after 9-11. Seeing those images, I think every person can describe exactly where they were and what they were doing when they saw these images on their television. And the shock and the horror. So I'm so interested to find out from your point of view, what was your response when you saw those images flash on on your TV screen? It was really difficult because you look at these images and you you see this, it's, you know, this murder of innocent people. You see the suffering. You see people jumping from the building. But the victim mentality is so ingrained in you, you turn it back onto yourself. 
that look this is awful but nobody cares about Muslims being killed in Palestine nobody cares about so you almost you will not almost you justify it you go look so this you is desensitized. awful desensitized exactly so you go look this is awful but this is happening us, to us every day and nobody cares so why should we be all oh this is awful in response almost you 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 make this equivalence that because people are dying elsewhere it's fine it's America have brought it on themselves almost and th- as I said the world changed completely and yeah. I think the Western world in certain countries turned their back on Muslim communities and Muslim communities suffered greatly because of that how, how did it affect your life living in the UK I wouldn't say too much I mean the, there were two things that happened there was People became very weary of the Muslim community because, I mean, for a long time, the Muslim community had just existed. Nobody had really paid much attention. There was a sizable Muslim community in Britain, and that was it. Um, I think it made me more radical to an extent because you saw people looking at Islam, and then these movements started off slowly in some countries that, you know, Islam is a religion of terror. So it makes you more radical. Right, mm-hmm. radicalism just breeds more radicalism, and that really happened. But day to day, I, I wouldn't say there were any huge changes. The changes that were happening were a lot were in my mind. There were there were paranoia. You know, there was paranoia that everyone has it in for us almost. And did this feed your radicalism? Oh yes, of course. You become more militant, and you become more extreme, and yeah, you 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 put up these boundaries and you're, you're trying to make more of a statement as well so you know people were going more to these kind of marches these anti-war marches and things and people were you know holding pictures of bin laden and, they, and these, these things happened in london so mm. it had two effects for one part of the community it was almost okay this is awful and we need to kind of show this isn't representative of us and for another part of the community which i was more part of it was look they think we're awful anyway so let's just let's be who we want to be let's be as extreme as we want you know they hate us anyway almost and when you traveled after that i mean the you know way of traveling carrying luggage and be you know the passport control did that did that change a lot for you after 9-11 i, I mean the only countries i went to were muslim countries so okay. i went to saudi arabia so i mean i didn't really feel it in saudi but arabia but the fact that you visited those countries and then entered the uk again were, were, you know was there any suspicious questioning or anything uh, like that? not really i think look britain is a very tolerant society and yes people get scared people get worried but on the whole it is very tolerant and you know, there, there is, well, like with any society, discrimination can happen because of paranoia. But on the whole, you know, when I look back, it really was nothing, to be honest. So we've established that you were becoming a lot more radical, that you grew up an anti-Semite, anti-Israel. I'm very interested to know, Kasim, what your beliefs were around Israel at that point. Um, they're very simple, to be honest. Um, it was basically, the, my view of history was that there was a Palestinian Arab Muslim state. The Jews from Europe had come, who had no link to this land, stolen the land and built Israel. And they were committing genocide, ethnic cleansing, and, and all apartheid, and all these buzzwords that are used. And the only way for peace was to for Israel to cease to exist. And, you know, it was seen as a stepping stone. You know, Israel is the Jewish state, so once Israel ceases to exist, the Jews have got nowhere to go. And then it becomes much wider than just being about Israel. So this was your system. But yeah. it, there was a shift. There was a time in your life when when your whole belief system changed. Because I started off the show asking the question, have you ever had to change a belief system? So this is very much a, a belief system from a very young age. Until what age were you when things started to change? Uh, I would have been around 21, 22. Um, I was at university, and it's... You were studying politics, weren't you? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, it was at the stage I was most radical that my beliefs started to change, and it was very gradual, because um, I'd come to this conclusion that I've done all I can do in terms of what is conventional activism, going to protests, all these things. And I thought, look, what am I actually doing, though? I'm not achieving anything. And that's when I thought I would go back to Pakistan and enlist at a, a jihadist training camp. I thought maybe that's the only way forward. Violence, is, actual violence, is the only way. Mm. Um, and then purely by chance, I was in a bookshop and I saw this book by Alan Dershowitz called The Case for Israel. Mm-hmm. 
you know, I saw this book and I think, look, Israel has no case. Who's who's written this? Why would they write this? So I start reading it, but purely to kind of argue against this Zionist propaganda as mm. I saw it. And for me, at the time, for me, Zionism was an awful word. It was has the most negative of connotations. So I start reading this book, and um, I'm confronted with facts which just seemed complete fantasy to me. This idea that uh, a Palestinian state, and Alan Dershowitz is somebody who is very much a supporter of the two-state solution. He says... He's a lawyer. Yes. Lives in the United States. Yes. Uh Uh, And he goes, look, a Palestinian state has never existed. That's not saying it shouldn't or there should be one, but historically it's never existed. That's just historical fact. And that just made no sense to me because I had my narrative of, you know, it being there and the European Jews stealing it. Being there before 48. Yes. you know, Palestine um, was there. Okay. Yes. So mm-hmm. at the end, there was always a Palestinian Arab Muslim state. So that was difficult for me to comprehend. And then he talks about the 1948 and the UN resolution. And he goes, look, the Israelis, the Jewish agency, the organizations that represented the Jewish people had accepted two states. They were fine with it. But it was the Arab states, not even the Palestinians who then invaded the, the young state of Israel. Again, this made no sense to me because I was literally told the opposite. Um, then he talks about modern history. He talks about the six days, 1967. He talks about the peace talks and some of the offers and he talks about Palestinian society and some of the human rights abuses. And this was just complete fantasy for me. I just couldn't comprehend that this had any truth to it. Not at all. I just was refusing to accept it. But you continued reading. Yes, I don't know. Maybe you curiosity. Yeah, curiosity. I, and you're kind of just thinking the cheek of this person. Yes, to exactly. You put know? these points forward. Uh-huh. Yeah. So when I finished reading the book, I thought, look, I need to disprove this. It's going to be really easy. I can debunk all of his uh, arguments. So I thought, look, a week of research, a few books will be fine. A week then turned into a month. A month then turned into a year, and a year turned into almost two years. Um, what kind of research were you doing? I was reading almost anything I could get my hands on, be it supportive of Israel, anti-Israel, by uh, somewhere in the middle. Even you know, I realized that my knowledge was so weak and non-existent to the Middle East. I was even reading encyclopedia entries on Israel, on Jerusalem, on the land of Israel, just to kind of understand. I, I knew nothing. I mean, I didn't... When he writes about the Jewish connection to Jerusalem, I mean, you know, and I... Looking back, that's something very basic. You know, when you study religion, it's something very basic, but it's something I knew nothing about. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to get some perspective, and I thought, look, fact is on my side, history is on my side. I'll be able to disprove these arguments quite easily. I just find it so interesting because we see the world the way we want to see the world through the, the belief system and through the filters that we have. So I find it interesting that through all the research, you were still able to remove yourself. I don't know how long it took you um, to remove yourself and then go, hang on, let me, let me be the unbiased spectator and, and now go through this information again. Did that take a long time it, to get to that point? It was very difficult. And even when I'd reached this point where I really wasn't sure, it was the the point of not being sure was really me not accepting the changed reality, mm-hmm. the actual reality. Um, and at that point, it's when it became very difficult because I suffered from this awful period for almost two months of very deep depression. Because it's very difficult to have a belief system that you know you're ready to die for, and then you're seeing it slowly erode. You're seeing it slowly erode, and you're seeing that it's built on lies, really. But it's still very difficult to go, okay, I was wrong. Mm, Uh, And Mm. that's what then prompted me to go to Israel. I thought, look, I need to get some closure on this once and for all because this is, you know, my hatred of Israel was an obsession. It was consuming so much of my time and so much of my life. It was very difficult for me to look in the mirror and go, look, you've wasted years of your life on this blind hatred for nothing. I can imagine that must have been very difficult for you, Kasim. We're going to take a a quick break and we will return. And then I'd like to hear about your visit to this country that, as you said, you had hated um, for so many years. It uh, is Conversations with Nikki and it is brought to you by studyapps.co.za. And just a reminder that you can visit the website conversationswithnikki.co.za and um, then you can get the podcast if you miss the show at all. Let's take a break and we'll be right back. Hi, my name is Esvia Prinsler and I'm the HOD of IT integration at Bridwin Preparatory School in Melrose. We started using study apps about six months ago and have seen astonishing results. 
we were quite amazed to see how quickly the kids have been able to use study apps and the benefits it has shown with regards to reinforcing what they've already learned inside the class. I would highly recommend study apps for any school. Studyapps.co.za Welcome back. Conversations with Nikki. I'm Nikki Seberini. Delighted to be with you and thanks so much for tuning in. It's such an interesting conversation we are having. It's, it's about our belief system and challenging belief systems. And we all have a way of looking and interacting with the world and with one another. And uh, I started off and I said, have you ever got to a point when you've challenged those belief systems? And if so, how have things changed for you? And what did you go through? Because my guest, Kasim Hafiz, who has been sharing his story of growing up in the UK to Pakistani parents, uh, gro growing up as a Sunni Muslim um, and very much uh, anti-Semite and anti-Israel and just becoming more and more radicalized as he grew older and then reaching a point in his, when he, in his early 20s when he came across Alan Dershowitz's book, um, The Case for Israel, and all of a sudden he started to research um, the the history around Israel, um, the conflict with with Palestine, with the Palestinians, and and slowly this belief system started to change. And Kasim, you you described this this two month depression um, because you you're looking at the way you've been brought up in a belief system, and, and and you're questioning whether it was a lie, whether it was the reality, and if it was a lie, then you start to to think about everything in your life. Oh well, yes, of course. and that's very difficult to face. Yes, it's you know you you how do you kind of put that into context? Mm. Kind of it's it's very difficult to just carry on as everything's okay when you the very foundations that literally your kind of life have been built on you're not really sure of them anymore. It's so you made a decision to go to Israel. I mean, what did you think you would find in Israel? I think I was seeking for some sort of validation for my previous views. I was hoping that I could disprove everything I'd read over the last few years. Mm. I could find that this real extreme, this Jewish extremist awful state. Uh, really, that was really the hope. It's it's awful, but I thought m maybe I'll see. It. I thought if I don't see that, if I see something else, then will confront it. it. It's a lot easier for me anyway to process things when you physically see them. You know, you can read something, but when you physically see it, it sometimes it's really difficult to then try and argue against it even in your own mind. Mm. Booking the ticket, did you tell family and friends? Um, not really. I, I told my sister, me and my sister are very close, I told my sister, but other than that, it, I was didn't really say much. You just went in. Yes. And what was it like? Describe, descri describe entering Israel, this this <laughs> it, country that had uh, held so much hatred um, for was, you for so it long. It was very surreal, to be honest, because look, when we talk about apartheid, um, the, the what you think of is South Africa. You know, you think of South Africa because that was a real example of apartheid. And this slogan, apartheid Israel, has been thrown out for so long. So that's what I was looking for. So I'm looking for... Separation. Uh, yes. Arab-only bus stops, you know, Jew-only restaurants and all these things. And I'm seeing the opposite, and that was difficult to comprehend. But you think, okay, maybe, you know, it's not so brazen. Maybe it's slightly hidden in society. So I think, look, you, I, I'll talk to people, and in Jerusalem they've got the main market, and it's just, it's very crazy. There's pe all sorts of people you see, such a diverse... Um, uh, a cross section of society you see Christians, Muslims, Jews I mean Christian monks and that was very strange for me mm -hmm. just in its own right um, so I started talking to people uh, you know somebody who was very noticeably Muslim he was with his wife who had a head so I, you know I, I started talking to him and I did this awful thing when I think maybe very British of, you know it must be very awful for you living here this really condescending kind of yes. Uh, statement and he looks at me and he goes look, what are you talking about and I say I repeat it I think maybe he's not understand what I said and he goes no look really what are you talking about what do you mean I went it must be difficult for you you're an oppressed person and all these kind of all these kind of spiel I, I rattle off and he goes look are you trying to tell me they're in Great Britain everything is fine are you trying to tell me in England every minority community is completely fine there aren't any problems and firstly, I mean, that kind of took me by surprise. It's like, well, no. But he goes, look, it's not, it, you know, for me as an Israeli Arab, are there some issues in society? Of course. 
but you're telling me there are none in Great Britain? I was like, okay, look, fair enough. And he went on to explain, he went, look, this is my home. I'm Israeli, my family live here, they've always lived here, I'm very proud of living here. It's democratic, it's free, I can practice my religion. Uh, and what really floored me, he went, look, at you. I've served in the army here, and that really floored me. I mean, for me, a Muslim serving in, in the IDF, this oppressive totalitarian army was just unheard of. Mm. So I thought, look, that, that that's just strange. So I think, okay, and it's funny. I thought of him, what people now think of me, going, look, you know, he's been he's been brainwashed by Zionist propaganda. So I, it's quite ironic now people think that's what's happened to me. Uh, so I carried on talking to people. You know, I carried I thought, look, I'll find somebody else. And I spoke to more Muslims. I spoke to Christians. I spoke to Druze, I mean, the small religious community who have been oppressed all over the Middle East. And, I mean, to my surprise, they are possibly the most fiercely patriotic about Israel, the, the mm-hmm. Druze community. And... You know, I, I ended up speaking to this Druze gentleman who told me about the the community and how long they've been in Israel and why they love Israel and it's democratic and you know he spoke of this pride of us, you know, that being Arab representation of Druze representation in Parliament in the military and all facets of society and that was that was really eye opening because you're directly seeing it. You're you're seeing somebody who you thought is this oppressed person who's got no rights and they're talking with beaming pride of how much they love this country. So what is going through your mind at that point? It became difficult to process and I just thought this makes no sense but it's like you're seeing it now it's like what more do you want what more evidence are you looking for mm. And but I just thought look I need to take a break from it I just need to take a break I'm in Jerusalem I'll do the tourist things now you know just to kind of disconnect slightly mm-hmm. and just be a tourist really um, so I went to the old city and I went to the Church of the Sepulchre, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, and the the one site I hadn't visited was the Western Wall. And, I th- and my kind of, con- I thought at the time, I thought, I'm not going to be allowed near the Western Wall because I'm not Jewish. And that spanned a lot for my visit to Saudi Arabia. Uh, How so? My visit to Saudi Arabia, I went on a religious pilgrimage, and when you go on, on pilgrimage, you go in groups, you know, and the group I went with were, were people from the local community, you know, people I knew, some family, and I mean, I'm nearly 30 now, and I've never experienced, firstly, the level of racism I experienced in Saudi Arabia anywhere in the world. Really? I've never experienced that level of open racism anywhere in the world. Uh, Not only to me, not only to my friends, but to other people. What do you mean racism? Racism, I mean, you are made to jump through these ridiculous hoops at checkpoints, etc., for no reason by security, because you're not an Arab because you're Pakistani and you hear it you know people will say that you will be people will step in front of you in a queue and go look you're a Paki which is vastly offensive in the UK it's a mm. racist term you're a Paki you can wait you know you see people who it's strange with Saudi Arabia there's extreme wealth and extreme poverty and you see it physically the people who are extremely poor it's almost the darker your skin the poorer you're going to be mm. and you, people mm. call black people abd which means slave in Arabic that's what they call them you know I saw Arabs calling you know people, people they didn't know black people abs which means slave and it's acceptable so there you were on a religious pilgrimage feeling isolated and yeah. marginalized yeah you just it's it, crazy. It, kind of, it really <clears throat> makes it difficult to then really connect with the spirituality right, of the place right. um and then in terms of the religious aspect i saw people i mean friends who were literally manhandled by the saudi religious police because they prayed slightly different from what the Saudis would dictate as being true Islam. They did something which the Saudis thought this isn't true Islam and would l- literally drag them out of the mosque. Hmm. Uh, I mean, it was, it's atrocious. It really is. It, it is it's, shocking. It's, it's shocking. Um, so here I am. So in you Israel. thought in Israel there's no you, way you'd be you, you able to go to the Western Wall? Yeah, because right. I thought, look, you know, Saudi Arabia is, has its problem, but Israel's worse. It was always worse, worse in my mind. So I think, look, I'm here. I may as well try. They say, what's the worst that can happen? No, you can't. You're not Jewish. Go away. So I thought, fine. I went. Walked straight through security. No problem. So I thought, okay. So I thought, okay, look, this is very bizarre. This is strange for me. So I'm walking towards the Western Wall, and I'm taking steps towards it. And I'm thinking, what am I doing here? This is, what do I do? What am I doing? And I put on um, a skull cap, um, which they have, they used to have these awful cardboard ones that you could take. So I put that on and I'm walking towards the western wall and uh, I get to uh, I get to the wall and I'm thinking, what do I do? Do I pray? Do I uh, touch the stones? I, I really had no clue. Mm-hmm. So, 
You know, I've learned in many situations one of the best things you can do when you're not sure what to do is just copy the person next to you. <laughs> so, I mean, thankfully for me, it wasn't somebody who was ultra religious and praying or anything. Say, my yeah, it could have been very <laughs> awkward. Um, but there's a guy next to me. He had his arm extended on on the wall. So I did the same thing. And then, I don't know, instinct, I don't know, maybe drawn in, whatever. I I don't know. My forehead eventually went to, uh, was against the wall and I closed my eyes. And, you know, without sounding too cliche or too cheesy or too corny, it was almost a eureka moment. It's when I was able to kind of process all my thoughts together. What I've seen, what I've heard, what who I used to be, how I felt, and this new reality. And it was the that moment when I went... I'm wrong. I have got it so wrong. Wow. I expended so much effort, so much hatred, and for what? Based on lies, a wow. hatred for people for for no reason. Hmm. And you know that 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 was. That seemed that's huge. To come to come to that kind of a conclusion and to say I was wrong is huge. Did you feel it physically in your body? Did you feel weak at the knees? Did you feel how are you feeling? Yeah, I, okay, I physically. Look, I'm not an emotional person in, in general. You know, the only time I really get emotional is over sport, to be honest. Um, but you know, <laughs> one of those. Huh? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's um, <laughs> what can I say? Um, but you know, I, I I actually cried. I just couldn't. It was almost it was almost all this frustration, this anger, this misplaced anger bursting to the kind of the surface and I just couldn't control it and you know I burst into tears mm. and you know I, it's actually quite interesting I walked away I was walking away from the western wall that day and as you come to the western wall uh, before the, the actual area there's a table like an information desk and crying and uh, I was walking past and the, the, the chap at the desk uh, who's quite orthodox I look are you okay no no I'm fine he went yeah, it's quite an experience and I went look I'm Muslim, this is new for me. He went, look, you're in Jerusalem. This is everybody's home. And, you know, it was kind of like... Is that what he said to you? Yeah, it's kind of, mm. you know, it's... Sometimes people are there at the right time, you know, right time, right mm. place. And mm. I kind of walked away and I realized, for me, the need for change, really. Uh, a eureka moment usually is something that you want to share with a whole lot of people. It's like I've seen the light, yeah. or I'm putting to bed certain ideas, and I'm I'm opening up a new door and new experiences. And there you were alone in Israel, surrounded by Jews, people who you had really never come across your entire yeah. life, people you had loathed and and feared, I suppose. Yeah. Um, so where did you go to from there, walking away with this change in your core belief system? Yeah, I, I did. I think I did something which I can only say is very British. I found somewhere to have a hot Don't drink. Don't say a cup of tea. <laughs> you know, they didn't have tea, so I had to go with coffee. You know, I did something very British and thought, look, I need to sit down at uh, a branch of aroma and kind of process this. And I thought, okay, look, I realized that Israel is not this evil state. It is a democracy. It is, you know, it, it has many of the freedoms which I hold dear as being a British citizen now. You know, what I really love about Britain, Israel has those same values so I thought let me get to know this place you know let me go to know Israel let me see the history let me travel around and I need to go to the Palestinian territories as well you know I can't say I understand one side or think I understood one side let me let me go there as well so I spent these next two two and a half weeks traveling around speaking to people um, and what was it like in the territories you know it wasn't look anybody will say to you that it's not perfect but also the level that it's exaggerated to how much poverty and disastrous it is is also vast. It, it shocked me because I've seen poverty. I've seen poverty in Pakistan. I mean, I've seen even poverty here in South Africa. You know, some people living in these, these small huts and small kind of shanty towns. And I just, it, it shocked me because I thought it's, I'm not, like I said, it's not perfect. But I was expecting it to be this human rights disaster. Right. And, you know, I come across the National Bank of Ramallah and it's this huge glass skyscraper and it's, it was very strange. And th I think what really struck me was that people on the ground, the people I spoke to, felt that they weren't, their voice wasn't being heard. They went, look, our leaders don't represent us. People who protest in our name, call it from boycotts and all these things don't represent us. You know, they may go disrupt a performance, then they go home. 
it doesn't change my reality. It doesn't give me more rights. It doesn't mean that the Palestinian Authority are going to allow me to travel freely or I'm going to be able to do whatever I want. It's not going to stop them pumping out hate images on TV that my children have to watch. And, you know, it kind of... You know, when somebody tears into you and tears into the person you were, mm -hmm. it really has an effect. And I think that was the real overwhelming thing I found, that people want peace. And all I was doing in my previous years was perpetuating the conflict, causing barriers and causing hatred. And th that kind of, that it has an impact because you think, I'm not doing anything for the better. I'm, I'm part of the problem. You know, I'm a massive part of the problem. And it's the level of coexistence I saw in some areas which really kind of made me think that I need to do more. I need to, I need to do something about this. <laughs> Such a fascinating story, um, Kasim, and, and um, I think so admirable to be so very honest because I just wonder how many people, when they do get to that point of questioning, go beyond to that point of no return. I think it's a very, very, can be a very lonely place to, to visit. Um, if you've just tuned in, thank you. It's wonderful to be with you. Nikki Seberini, Conversations with Nikki. I have Kasim Hafiz in the studio. Um, Kasim is uh, from the UK visiting us. Uh, he is a, a Muslim Zionist, really, which just in itself is just quite a, 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 an outrageous not outrageous. It's very. It's it's a, it's a difficult term to to get one's head around, uh, especially because of Kasim's story that he shared with us growing up as as a as a fundamentalist and having these very radical views and then changing his point of view, his belief system as he got older in life and researching and then visiting Israel. And I hope that you are enjoying this conversation. So let's take a break and we'll be back and just find out what Kasim is doing now. Um, once that whole core belief system had been shifted so radically. Hi, my name is Esvia Prinsler and I'm the HID of IT integration at Bridwin Preparatory School in Melrose. We started using study apps about six months ago and have seen astonishing results. We were quite amazed to see how quickly the kids have been able to use study apps and the benefits it has shown with regards to reinforcing what they've already learned inside the classroom. I would highly recommend study apps for any school. Studyapps.co.za and Conversations with Nikki is brought to you by studyapps.co.za. Visit their website and find out more. Um, I'd just like to take the opportunity very quickly to welcome our syndication partner listeners, Kawi FM, Eldos FM, Chai FM, West Coast FM, that's in Namibia, and uh, 90.3 MC in Plett, Neisner FM, Wild Coast in East London, and Bay FM MP. Great to have you all on board. Every single show is podcast. Just visit my website, Conversations with Nikki, one word, Nikki. He spelled N-I-K-I dot C-O dot Z-A. And you can get uh, all the shows. So if you have had to leave at some point and you missed out on some of the important parts of the show, don't fear. You can take a listen to those as well. So Kasim Hafiz is in the studio sharing the story, going to Israel, having this life-changing moment. And I'm sure, Kasim, you almost felt like you wanted to look into the mirror and you would see a different person. But the same Kasim stared back at you. So getting off the airplane from Israel with this complete changed point of view, the way of seeing that your your whole belief system had been shattered um, and yet people were still seeing Kasim, the old Kasim, and interacting with you and uh, conversing and all of that in, as, as they all would, as they had for, for many, many years. What was that like for you? Um, it was very surreal, to be honest, um, because, you know, I was confronted with these, this huge change. I was confronted with the options of, do I just go, look, I've changed and carry on with life you it's know it's a point you know, of view yeah, okay you know, so a point, point of view, view. Look, right. we got it wrong that's fine or do I actually be vocal about this do I speak out about this do I kind of do what's right and you know for me it was doing what's right I had to kind of speak out and it was strange because I kind of I made it very high priority and it, it was literally talking to everyone I could all of my friends and explaining this kind of change and it was very it was difficult from them going from, you know, from me being back and them being completely normal and asking me the same kind of questions which had these anti-Semitic undertones to them to now being very either standoffish or out-and-out out hostile. It was, I, I guess I But didn't you can imagine how difficult it is 
for them to see whether it's a relative or to see a friend, you know, when you relate on a certain level and then that change, that shifts. Yeah, That's a risk you took. Yeah, of course. It's a risk I took. And I, look, I, I've never for, for a millisecond regretted it because, look, for me it was doing the right thing and that was the most important thing. And it's opened up my life in so many different ways because now I do question everything. Now I do look at the world through a much brighter lens where... I was almost there was one issue that dominated and that issue was Israel and all my effort was based around hatred now you know there I, there are other causes I'm deeply committed to human rights you know women's rights and these are things you know gay rights these are things I'd never have even contemplated right. a few years ago mm -hmm. um so you know it was almost like these doors opening really these doors to kind of a much more happier and free soul you couldn't close the door. No. You can't. You, you couldn't turn back. No, uh, and I, you know, I never would want to look. And you know, some people, you know, I've been attacked, and I've had all people say all sorts of awful things. And you know, sometimes it is awful. You think you don't know me. <laughs> you know, you don't know me. You've read something, or you've heard, and you've made these huge assumptions about me. And I think, okay, that's fine, because that's your problem. It doesn't really affect me. And doesn't it really affect no, you? No, because I think I am. Um, and it sounds really. Uh, it may sound really kind of. Conceit, but I'm really happy. My life is so happy now. And the main reason mm. I do what I do is, one, I have a deep kind of love for Israel now. It, it's, some, it's somewhere which is very dear to me. Also, I have a deep love of the Palestinian people, and I want a better future for them. I want peace. And also, if I can stop one person feeling the anger and hatred I did, be it over Israel, be it over something else, that's an achievement for me. That will make everything so worth it even if you're standing alone even if i'm standing alone sometimes that's what you have to do you know i i hmm, believe i think it's very brave you know i i believe everyone's accountable for what they do be it to some higher power be it to the, themselves be it in 20 years time when your kids ask you know when this was happening what did you do i don't want to look back and think i just sat there silently and just chose the easy route you know anything worth fighting for is never easy I think that resonates very deeply, especially in the country in which you're saying those words yeah, uh, coming out of our past. And uh, I just wonder how many people, and we look at the greats, we look at the leaders, we look at the freedom fighters in this country, and we revere them. I mean, we look at our former president, Nelson Mandela, and all of his comrades, and they stood alone, and they, yeah. they lost time with family and friends. Many of them lost their lives, tragically, because they stood up um, so strongly for what they believed in, and, and we're so grateful for that because we live in the country that we do today because of, of the sacrifices that they made. So it is a sacrifice that you made, but I have to ask the question what is your relationship like with your family um it varies to be honest with my father it's non-existent we have nothing to do with each other uh which looks that's so sad you know it really is um but the kind of person he is if that if he can't reconcile with that then i'm actually better off i think did you have yeah. a discussion with him, Kasim, or did he just hear that you had changed and then no, he turned I, I, his back? I had a discussion. I mean, with me sharing my story and all this, this is it was never intentional. You know, it was just talking to people, mm. talking to people around me. Uh, and w I talked about it, and it was just, you know, too far, too, too much. It was, you know, there was no, the, it was impossible. You know, how could I side with the Jews almost? You know, that's how it was seen. That's how people see it. How can you side with the Jews? How can you side with the enemy? And it's like, there will never be peace if you see them always as your enemy. He felt like he had lost his son. Yes, I guess. Mm. Um, and for me, I just think, look, I'm not going to cry about it. I'm not going to even get down about it. It's a choice he's made. And if that's the level of his mentality, then I'm better off without that sort of person in my life. Sure. Again, I'm going to say, not, not easy. Your mom, your sister? Uh, my sister is very supportive. You know, she doesn't always agree with what I say, but she's always supportive. And my sister being a, a teacher is very much, uh, there are two sides to every story. Let's have a look at it. Let's talk mm -hmm. about it. But, you know, she's always been very supportive. Uh, my mom is not political at all, so she's not really got involved. I, I don't think she's happy about it and there are voices from extended family who are maybe saying you should maybe be doing something about it but I guess you know I'm her only son it's very difficult to just kind of cut people, off. well it depends what kind of person you are but I guess it's difficult for her to kind of just cut me off completely so we still have a relationship and she just avoids the topic altogether.
So this this was in 2007 that you went to Israel, yes. came back a changed person, yes. and that was six years ago. What yeah. is Kasim Hafiz doing today? Today, um, I mean, now I, I, I share my stories with people all over. Um, I do a lot in terms of Israel advocacy. I do a lot in terms of talking about radicalism, uh, human rights, all sorts. At the moment, I'm in South Africa to share my story uh, and talk about my personal journey. Um, and it's it's particularly important to me to be here. Um, I was very fortunate the first day I was in Johannesburg to go to the Apartheid Museum. And, you know, I've always grown up. My sister was always very interested in South Africa. Uh, so I've always had that kind of in the background. And, you know, she was, would, would talk about, you know, Nelson Mandela and all these things. So to be here, it's amazing. And also because of apartheid and because of this slander of, you know, Israel's an apartheid state. You know, I was talking to somebody about apartheid a few weeks before I came out and they went, oh yeah, of course, Palestinian apartheid. They didn't know that apartheid, real apartheid happened in South Africa. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the sad things for me. I think when we use this term and it's, for me, it's almost been handed over by many South Africans willingly. We are demeaning the struggles, the true hardships, and the the horror that was endured by blacks and coloured people under the crime of apartheid. We're demeaning that whole struggle and we're turning it into just almost a footnote of history. And that's really sad because, you know, to say that Israel is an apartheid state, it, it demeans all of what apartheid was in South Africa. It demeans all those hardships, all those struggles, and the the, the eventual fight against apartheid by the people of South Africa of all colours to rid them of that system and South Africa's this beautiful example where after everything that happened you know and when Nelson Mandela was released when Madiba was released he didn't talk about retribution he didn't talk about I'm going to hunt down the people who put me in prison he talked about a future building a future together a, a rainbow nation and that that should be an inspiration to everybody and it should be something that we in the Middle East they should look to and just in communities in general let's look to a future together the past is the past sometimes there are wounds that won't ever be healed sometimes wounds take time to heal but let's look for a shared future of not tolerance tolerance is the bare minimum let's look for coexistence and mutual acceptance you also in a country where you have huge advocates for the belief that Israel is an apartheid state yes. you know some some uh, people who are, you know, have been have featured very strongly in the struggle believe that. Yeah, so it's a it's a loud voice that you are that you are speaking or shouting or whispering yeah, against so what what whatever it is. Yeah, so what is your what is your mission in life? Um, really, when it really comes down to it, I, I think it's look, don't hate people, don't hate people irrationally, don't hate people, and question everything. You know, look. It, supporting Israel is a huge part and it's a personal choice I made you know I'm not asking for everyone who hears me talk you know go out and support Israel it's a personal choice there are reasons I support Israel and I'm very proud of that but question everything you know because you're told something it doesn't mean it's true because a hundred people say the same thing it doesn't mean it's true because somebody went there saw it and, come and t comes and tells it you doesn't mean it's true experience life we live in an amazing and beautiful world and I think one of the saddest things is we don't actually we're not open to it there are so many different cultures and so many different kinds of people and so many different kinds of beliefs we just we we sit in our own little boxes and maybe it's easier maybe it's easier to see them as being over there and different and scary and weird but that way we'll never ever have true peace among people mm. the this community that you came out of quite radical spoke about violence do you ever feel that your life is at risk? Um, look, I, I've had threats and I've had people come up to me, but it doesn't bother me. I think the whole point of that is to cause fear. It's mm -hmm. to make me stop talking. And I think if those kind of people are opposing me, you know, I, I've also had, like, things written uh, about me, really awful things, by far-right Nazi groups. And I think... If they don't like me, I'm doing something right, you know? <laughs> if those they kind write, of at least they're writing about you, and then more people would listen to you. Yeah, um, so, you know, <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> um, so I think if they did hate me and they are writing all these awful things about me, then I'm doing something right. So I should be, it's, it's almost a badge of honor, really.
Well, Kasim, I, I think it's been such a wonderful conversation that we've had, and I thank you very much for taking time out. I know that you're flying all over and you're going to be leaving for Durban, and uh, a, a fantastic message about uh, seeing all and, and peace and acceptance of all, and to have the strength of character to change your belief system and to move forward and want to affect so many people in a positive way. I admire that greatly. Thank you so much. It's been fantastic. Thank you. Kasim Hafiz uh, on conversation conversations with Nikki. I hope that you enjoyed it. And uh, we all have our own belief systems. We all come from different places and we resonate with different things. And to come across someone who has the, the, the strength of character to stand up and move forward, I think is an example. However, we want to include that in our life. What a fascinating story Kasim has. And I hope you enjoyed it. So if you missed uh, any part of that podcast, uh, well, I'm at the show that it has been podcast, just go to conversations with Nikki. .co.za. Nikki is spelled N-I-K-I. And um, yes, and also just a reminder that, of course, Conversations with Nikki was brought to you by studyapps.co.za. Until next time, have a great one and look after yourself. Goodbye. Conversations with Nikki was brought to you by studyapps.co.za, South Africa's leading education app for tablets.